And then this morning we read from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one and come away. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we read from the Song of Solomon, or sometime in some Bibles it's entitled the Song of Songs. It is a love poem, stanza and stanza, verse to verse, expressing love, the desire to give love and receive love. As you read through it, it sounds like two young people are in love. People of faith, the church, have not always done well knowing how to deal with human love expressed with such intimacy or expressed sexually, if you will. So some interpreters say this is a love poem between God and Israel or God and God's people with the advent of Christianity People used it to describe Christ's love for us, for the church. But if you read through it, no matter how you interpret it, you cannot miss the great passion and intimacy and desire that the authors are writing about. Their desire to give love and receive love, to express it and experience it. It's such an exhilarating experience. I remember when my wife Mary and I were in love. We were engaged to be married. We were doing some premarital counseling. The counselor asked us to describe what we liked or loved about the other person. So we enthusiastically began to describe what we loved about the other person. Apparently we went on a little too long. She finally kind of chuckled and said, okay, it's clear that you two see each other through rose-colored glasses. Love does that to a person. We know that from medical research and scientific research that when a person's in love, they have more energy. They get a boost in their immune system their endorphins and their hemoglobin all spike upward it gives them more energy and vitality love is good for us it brings us joy and fullness of life we are meant and designed for relationship love fills us with life whether it's between people or receiving the love of God, or the love of Christ, or the presence and love of the Holy Spirit. When love is alive, the future looks brighter. The future looks so much better. We are ready to move into the future with passion and possibility. Our lives are full of energy, and we have a zest and a vigor for living. I shared you were here last week, you might remember that some of us on staff are studying a book out called Positive Intelligence by Shirzad Shamin. He's a guy who's done a lot of neuroscience, studied our brains, studied over 500,000 people, looked at MRIs. He says most of us spend most of our time in the part of our brain he calls the survivor brain. It's the part that identifies danger and risk, pain and problems. He says, though, it also is the part of the brain that is critical of things. So he calls it the judge. He says it's really good at negatively judging yourself and others and life circumstances, always looking for the problems, full of criticism, full of complaint, 
He says it's that negative voice that many of us have running in our heads over and over again, causing insecurity and doubt and anxiety and fear. He says that's all happening in one part of the brain. He calls it the judge. But he says the problem is the judge is not good at everything, but often we stay in that part of the brain trying to do everything. But he says it's not good at joy. It's not good at creativity. It's not good at curiosity or learning. It's not good at peace or patience or kindness. It's not good at love. He says all of that happens in a different part of our brain, the positive intelligence part of our brain, as he labels it, or what he calls the sage part of our brain. In the sage or the positive intelligence part of our brain, that's where wisdom resides. It's where we experience joy and love and happiness and creativity. It's the place where compassion and empathy generate from the sage part of our brain. As he's describing how the sage part of the brain works. He tells a story he calls the stallion story. You may have heard it before. I'd heard it before. It's an old Chinese proverb. I wrote my own version a few years ago. I call it maybe so, maybe no. It tells the story of an wise but poor farmer who's out in his field one day plowing the fields when a wild stallion comes galloping upon his land. He sees the stallion, goes and opens the gate to his corral. He lures the horse into his corral and closes the gate. The neighbors see that he's captured this fine, wonderful, strong horse. They all come over and congratulate him and say, this is the most wonderful thing that could ever happen. He says, maybe so, maybe no. Before he has a chance to break it and turn it into a farm animal that can help him with his farm, thieves come one night and steal the horse. He wakes up the next morning, goes out to the corral, and it is empty. The neighbors see what has happened. They come over and lament with him and say, Oh, no, this is the worst thing that could ever happen to you. He says, Maybe so, maybe no. A few days later, he's out in his fields working, and through the trees, he sees the stallion coming, but this time followed by several mares. He runs and opens the gate, and the stallion leads all the mares into the corral. He closes the gate. It's wonderful. The neighbors rush over to celebrate, say, oh my, you're the most fortunate person ever. This is fantastic. The old farmer says, Maybe so, maybe no. The farmer has a teenage son. He wants to ride that horse. The farmer says, oh no, the stallion is too wild. The farmer goes off to work. Guess what the boy does? He goes straight to the corral. He's able to harness the horse. He jumps on its back. He goes galloping across the fields. It is exhilarating. It is fantastic. But before long, he realizes he's not in control. The horse is running wild, and he's thrown off. The neighbors see the boy get thrown off. They run over there. He has broken his leg terribly. They pick him up and take him back to the old farmer. They say, oh, no. This is the most horrible thing that could ever happen to you. The only person that could help you farm in your old age, and now he can no longer help. How terrible this is. The old farmer says, maybe so, maybe no. The very next week, Military recruiters come through this small farming community. They're looking for every able-bodied young man. They take them one by one until they've taken them all off to war. Except one, the boy with a broken leg. Maybe so, maybe no. 
How do you look at life? Life happens in all kinds of different ways. The sage perspective reminds us that it's not so much what happens to us, but how we respond that makes the biggest difference. The book Positive Intelligence points out when we only use the part of our brains that is the judge, we become overreactive, we become filled with negativity, with complaints and criticisms, and we end up seeing life as just one crisis coming after another. But the author says we have a choice. We can tap into that other part of our brain, the sage or the positive intelligence part of our brain, and it's really good at looking for the good, looking for the gift, looking for the possibilities, whatever life is bringing you. So let me suggest to you this morning that there is a similarity between being in love or experiencing love and intentionally tapping into the sage part of your brain. They both bring us more joy. They both bring us more possibility. They both bring us to a place where we can believe in a more positive future. I think you can hear how this works in the text this morning. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Can't you hear the energy and The vitality, how everything looks better, smells better, the earth is alive. There's such energy, such vitality, such a zest for living. It's described in these verses. So much joy and excitement and anticipation of a positive future. But you do not have to be in love. To experience all of that goodness of life, the fullness or the abundance of life. You have a brain that can help you with that. You can intentionally use the part of your brain that's really good at all of those positive kinds of things. But it's also described in the Bible. The Apostle Paul calls it living by the Spirit. If you've read his letter to the Galatians, you know in that letter he contrasts life in the flesh and life in the spirit. He says life in the flesh is characterized by enmity and strife and jealousy and envy and anger and disunity and riotous living. But he says it doesn't have to be that way. As followers of Christ, we can live And walk with the Spirit or walk by the Spirit, he says. He says you can know when you're living by the Spirit because it changes your focus. You'll know it's happening when you focus on love, joy, and peace. Patience, kindness, and goodness. You'll know it when you're focused on faithfulness and humility and self-control. What would you like your life to be like? Which way would you like to live? You have a choice. You do not have to be falling in love to experience the fullness of life. One of our out-of-town members had a birthday this week. 
She was turning 100 years old. She still completely lucid, lived at her own home alone, been widowed about 20 years until about a year ago when she moved to live with her daughter. We met her during COVID. She began to watch us, of course. She had had a church. She's a longtime Methodist, but when all the churches were closing, we were still broadcasting. So she began to worship with us and then call and write us and let us know who she was. She was a delight to get to know. Over these last three or four years, I've had occasion to call her a handful of times. She's always upbeat, always has a positive outlook. So I called to wish her a happy birthday. She said, oh, the ladies in my former church over at Pryor are throwing me a birthday party this weekend. I don't know what they have cooked up, but I'm ready to roll with it. (laughs) That's her attitude. I ask her, is there anything in particular that you would credit with giving you such a long and full life? She only thought about it a half a second. She said, you know, I always tried to laugh a lot. She said, you know, there's not always something out there or in your life to laugh about, but you can always laugh at yourself. And then she let out a big burst of laughter. I think she's a woman tapping into the sage part of her brain. I think she's a person of faith who's walking by the Spirit. I think she is in love with life. And she's a great example for all of us in terms of how we can choose to live. Don't you imagine that in a hundred years she's had some ups, but she's also had some downs. She's had some fantastic things happen to her, and she's probably also had some tragedies. And yet she, at 100 years old, is still looking for the good in life. She's still looking for the gifts and the possibilities. She's still looking toward a positive future. What a blessing. What a way to live. What an example of faith might it be an example for each and every one of us so that we too might know the abundance which God intends for all of us. Amen. And thanks be to God.